goes to at the at the end of the talk, I'll just give a little primer on how to use the atlas and um, <clears throat> the things you can get out of it. So, uh, but today I'm going to talk about the ecoregions of New York, and just by looking at this this satellite picture of New York, which is the second largest state east of the Mississippi, that you can see different regions of the state just by sort of picking out. You can see the Adirondacks here, and the Catskills down here, the mountainous areas, and then the, the big river valleys. Of course, the Finger Lakes over here, and Long Island down here on the coastal plain. So you can see that there are a lot of different um, parts to New York, a lot of different geographies, and a lot of plants and ecosystems that go with those. So let's see. Here we go. So why are uh, is the knowledge of uh, ecoregions important? Well, it, it's it's important to understand plant distribution in New York and the distribution of uh, environments and habitats throughout the state and what plants grow where. And uh, also for people that are managing ecosystems, preserves, uh, what should be in those areas that they're trying to restore areas and things like that. Uh, for example, in this new book, uh, The Native Plant Primer by Uli Lorimer, The Native Plant Trust, he has a little section about the importance of ecoregions and he has a little map there which shows the different ecoregions. So today I wanna to talk about, and the goals of the talk are to understand what ecoregions are, to learn about the different ecoregions in New York, and to learn how to obtain more information about those ecosystems and flora of each ecoregion. Then there'll be a quiz at the end, not really. So let's start out by talking about what is an ecoregion. It is a large geographically distinct area of the state with similar environmental and physical conditions and a similar assemblage of ecological communities. So what does that mean, assemblage of ecological communities? What are ecological communities? I, I thought I'd talk about those first so you get an idea of <clears throat> what those are. And an ecological community, for example, a red maple hardwood swamp is a distinct assemblage of interacting plant and animal populations. So you have uh, a community dominated by red maple. Um, there could be beaver or mink in that area uh, as animal populations, which are interacting. They share a common environment, in this case, say, you know, uh, wetland. They occur repeatedly across the landscape. So there are many red maple hardwood swamps throughout the state. And they often integrate with each other. So, for example, a, a shrub swamp might integrate with a red maple hardwood swamp. And there might be a mosaic of those different communities in an area. No two are identical. Uh, a red maple swamp in, in eastern New York might be different from one in western New York with different, slightly different flora. And change is constant. So things are always happening to these communities. Uh, there can be Changes by animals, the beaver might ch you know, change the water levels. There might be uh, human interactions with cutting trees or you know, climate change, things like that. So they're always changing. And if you wanna learn more about ecological communities of New York State, there is a publication from the New York Natural Heritage Program called Ecological Communities of New York State by Greg Edinger and other ecologists. And you can get a paper copy uh, or a PDF, and uh, those communities are separated out into seven systems, a marine ocean, the estuarine, the saltwater wetlands, riverine lakes and streams, lacustrines, it means ponds and, and lakes, palustrine or freshwater wetlands, terrestrial uplands, and then subterranean things like caves. And then separated out also by natural and cultural. Cultural communities are ones that are highly influenced by humans. <clears throat> so you can also 
find out more about them online uh, by going to the Natural Heritage Program's online conservation guides. And these are, uh, if you just search for New York Conservation Guides, you'll come to this page here and you can search for communities there that arrow points towards the community guides. So for example, if you search for Red Maple Hardwood Swamp, you get one of the conservation guides, sort of a fact sheet about these different communities. On the upper right, you see the blue and white box, which talks about uh, all the different acts, aspects of that community. And then it also includes uh, photographs of what they look like. So just a really uh, amazing assemblage of information about all these communities. You can also see characteristic species. So if you're wondering what's in a red maple swamp, the most dominant species are listed here by trees, shrubs, uh, tall shrubs, short shrubs, and then herbs, and similar ecological communities. And then the structure of that community, for example, this is mostly a, uh, a treed community, and then shrubs and herbs. Non-vascular plants like mo uh, mosses also are in there. So it's a great resource to see what some of the plants are. And you can also look for ecological communities in your area. So if you wanted to see what ecological communities were mapped by the Heritage Program in Albany County, you go to the advanced search there, search on ecological communities, then put in Albany County, and you would come up with a list like this. This would be all the counties that are mapped. Not They're not all the communities in that are in that county because some of them are so common that they don't have really good examples. These are the most uh, significant and rare communities that are in Albany County. So down sort of three quarters of the way down, you can see Pine Barrens Vernal Pond, Pitch Pine Oak Forest, Pitch Pine Scrub Oak Barrens. Those are all natural communities that occur in the Albany Pine Bush. And then you can click on those and you can read about what they're composed of. So wherever you go, there's a natural community uh, around. So just when you're out uh, walking in preserves or driving around, you can sort of look to see this. Well, you might be familiar. This is a wooded community. This is an upland. This is a wetland, the big categories. And uh, it's a conifer forest or it's a deciduous forest. Then you can sort of figure out uh, exactly what kind it is. You can also go to the DEC Environmental Resource Mapper and uh, see what counties are mapped uh, what ecological communities are mapped in your area. So, for example, this around Albany here, uh, if you just search for environmental resource mapper, you can see that uh, the Albany pine bush is mapped there on the upper left. And I just put one of the communities there, Pitch Pine, Scrub Oak Barrens. The Hudson River in the middle there, uh, there's a bunch of communities there. I just put in the freshwater intertidal marsh, which we'll see a picture of later. On the right side, you'll see the Rensselaer Plateau, which has a lot of hemlock northern hardwood forest and uh, more sort of adirondack -y communities because it's so high up. And then along the Taconic Ridge on the far right, you see a common community there, Beach Maple Music Forest. And this one occurs uh, in more northern parts of New York State. So that gives you an idea of what ec ecological communities are, and that's what makes up an ecoregion, similar ecological communities, but it also similar environmental and physical conditions. So what are those similar environmental and physical conditions? Well, temperature is one. So you can see the hardiness zone map, you know, cold up in the north and warm down on Suff in Suffolk County and Long Island. Uh, precipitation, you can see the different precipitation around the state. Um, the yellow and orange areas up to red are the highest precipitation you can see in the Catskills there up in the Adirondacks and way out in uh, southwestern New York uh, with a lot of lake effects snow out there. 
geology is very important because geology uh, determines what kind of plants grow where also. As you can see in New York, there's a lot of different kinds of geology. And uh, you see up in the Adirondacks there, just a whole big mess of different <laughs> uh, uh, bedrock geology. And then also down along the eastern part of New York, down in the Hudson Valley, just lots of different kinds of bedrock geology. Uh, it's pretty similar on Long Island, uh, glacial outwash, and then more in the central part of the state, there are larger areas of the same kind of bedrock. And a bedrock also produces soil. So soils are important on a small, small scale. They can be deep or they can be shallow, um, absent, and then derive from different kinds of bedrock like limestone or shale, more acidic or more basic. And then the all important land use. So some ecoregions have a lot more land use than others. You can see the Adirondacks with their large green space and lakes. And then, uh, you know, east to west from Albany, the, the large cities, Utica, Rome, Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo, that that uh, go across the central part of the state. More green areas towards the south and the Catskills, and then the huge urban area south of the Hudson Highlands down through Long Island of New York City metro area. So we have one of the largest wild green spaces in the eastern US and also the largest urban area. So New York is pretty uh, unique in that respect. So what kind of ecoregional map are we going to look at? A lot have been made through the years, and um, we are using the one produced, started to be produced in 1987 by Amarnik, <clears throat> sort of called it the EPA ecoregions. And uh, this has been modified up through 2020. And it's uh, it, it takes in, um, well, they produced it in four levels. So level one and two are large, very large ecoregions. And then level three and four are the ones that we'll talk about today. And you can see here the different level three ones designated by numbers and the, and the level four ones designated by uh, uh, letters. So we'll go through those. And if you want to get your own copy of this, you can just uh, search for ecoregions of New York on the search engine, and then uh, you'll, you can click on the PDF here. This is a, a really nice PDF of the ecoregions of New York, or what I'm going to talk about. There's also a, a, a paper copy. I don't know if you can still get this. I have, I have this paper copy, um, but uh, the, the PDF is just as nice, and it goes through all the level three and level four ecoregions. So what we'll do is we'll take a little van trip from Montauk through Long Island and up through Lower Hudson, up to the Adirondacks, out to central New York and end our little trip in Jamestown and talk about all the ecoregions that we travel through on our little trip. So first we'll start out with the Atlantic Coastal Pine Barrens. And this makes up uh, number 84 there, you know, the purple. This makes up most of Suffolk County, except for the, the northern edge. And uh, it's called the, the Cape Cod Long Island ecoregion and the barrier coastal marshes. So there's also the barrier beaches along the southern end of Long Island too, all the way down to Breezy Point in Queens out to Montauk. And traveling through them, you can see that they are made up of large green spaces here, the Pine Barrens and also a lot of development. Uh, on the North Fork of Long Island, there's lots of agriculture, uh, <clears throat> different kinds of agriculture, and, and uh, now lots of uh, grape agriculture, vineyards. And that continues uh, to sort of the, the western part of Suffolk County. And these are glacial outwash plains. The soils are very sandy, poor soils and there's not much relief. Some of the most common 
uh, ecological communities there are the pitch pine oak forest, consisting mainly of pitch pine and scrub oak and, um, and, and herbaceous plants like uh, wintergreen and other ericaceous plants and ferns. And these are fire maintained. So um, either by wildfire or by prescribed fire. But a lot of these are now being affected by southern pine beetles. So that's a big change that they're undergoing right now. Some of the wetlands include these beautiful coastal plain pond shores and coastal plain ponds, which are kettle hole ponds out towards uh, Riverhead and, and Sag Harbor. And they depend on groundwater <clears throat> for their water levels. Sometimes when the groundwater is low and drought, they completely dry out. And you can see a whole different flora that that grows on the, the mud flats there. And then some years, for many years, sometimes they're totally full. And here's the where uh, Rose Coreopsis grows along the pond shores here, a very rare plant, which is our only native Coreopsis in New York. None of the yellow Coreopsis you see are native to New York. And then on the barrier islands, you get the dunes with beach grass and the sandy beaches. And behind the dunes, you often get interdunal swales, which are little freshwater wetlands, which have interesting plants like the sundews, the uh, spatulate leaf sundew, Drosera intermedia. All right, the next one is the Northeastern Coastal Zone uh, 59. And you can see on the map here that's takes in part of the, the northern part of Long Island, down to New York City, then up the Hudson River, all the way into Westchester County. <clears throat> and this one has a little more relief than, uh, than 84. And it um, has a little more, uh, the soils are a little richer and uh, you get more deciduous forests than the pitch pine forests. So here we are driving along um, Jericho Turnpike 25A and near Oyster Bay. And you can see the northern part of this ecoregion is a lot of forest because there's a lot of large estates in that area, sort of the Gold Coast of Long Island. Large, area, large estates and parks. And then south of that is the urban development. This urban development continues through New York City up into Westchester. But again, up in Westchester, you get uh, more of that forested large estates and parks. So what ec uh, ecological community do we have here? Well, this is what has happened to a lot of this ecoregion, really a lot of urban development, even though New York City does have some pretty interesting natural areas. Uh, not many on Manhattan, though. Along the north coast, though, we do have these nice maritime bluffs, which are um, uh, vegetated towards the top and then open sand towards the bottom with um, seaside goldenrod, solidated with sempervirens. And one of the most common forests there, there's Appalachian oak hickory and oak pine, but there's also these oak tulip tree forests, which have large tulip trees, very old, uh, and they grow very large and straight. And if you've ever been to Inwood Park up uh, on the northern tip of Manhattan, there's some really huge uh, tulip trees up there with an understory of wildflowers, uh, including purple trillium. But unfortunately, you know, a lot of this area has also been developed into suburbs, and uh, you get these successional southern hardwoods after development happens, and um, you also have a lot of overabundance of deer that have really eliminated the understory. And in place of that, you get things like Japanese stiltgrass here covering the understory, or Japanese barberry. So invasive species are a really serious problem in this ecoregion. Okay, so the next one is 64 Northern Piedmont. If you look over here to these tan areas, we have Staten Island down here. And then this is sort of a separated ecoregion, Staten Island. And up here is uh, Rockland County along the Tappan Zee of the Hudson River there. 
And we take our van across the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. Fortunately, we do have easy paths. And you can see Staten Island is one of the greenest <coughs> uh, boroughs of New York City. So there's still a lot of green space because they have a really nice green, uh, the, the greenway. And also um, it's more rolling hills than, than Long Island. So you have higher hills here like Toad Hill, which goes up to 400 feet. And then uh, on the Western side, you have all these wetlands here, part of the, what's called the Hackensack wetlands, which extend up into New Jersey and uh, towards Hackensack. So here's a uh, picture from Toad Hill. You can see forever from up there. So there is some pretty good relief on Staten Island. And in the wetlands of Staten Island, you might see a uh, red maple, some remnants of red maple sweet gum swamp. Sweet gum is really Westchester South to uh, Long Island. And, and this is a really nice community where you, yeah, where you have, um, dominated by red maple and sweet gum with this beautiful swamp azalea with white blooms. Up in Rockland County, if we cross the Tappan Zee Bridge, here we come into Rockland County, there's some green space in the Palisades along the edge, but most of Rockland County is, is hilly, it's low hills, but mostly developed <clears throat> urban area. You can see the Hudson Highlands to the west, which is not developed. This is also called uh, the Triassic Lowlands. And, some, and if you, uh, along 287 here, if you look at some of the outcrops, it's a very red Triassic uh, sandstone. And looking at, at the topo here, you can see the green areas are these, the Palisades, Hook Mountain here, and these state parks that go along the Hudson River. And, and then the rest of the area is more these sort of low hills. So the next Deca region, we'll, we'll skip across the highlands here. We'll talk about those later. Um, here's a picture of the Palisades with a sweet goldenrod on the lower left and that might occur on top of the Palisades. Uh, we'll go across down on the lower left here, across 58, which is the highlands, into this ecoregion, 67, sort of the light tan there, orangey tan, and that's called the Ridge and Valley section. So the Ridge and Valley, if you've ever gone through Pennsylvania, is very large, and this is just sort of the northern extension of it, and it's glaciated, where it isn't glaciated in Pennsylvania. So there are different limestone and shale valleys here, some slate, and which are good for agriculture. And then the ridge, there's just one large ridge is the Shangam Mountains. And there's some nice chestnut oak forest on the top of those ridges. So I'm sure some of you have been to the Shangams, Minnewaska and uh, Mohonk, maybe even climb up on those ridges. Here's our van down here going uh, across from the highlands to, um, up to Middletown, which is sort of in the middle of this section, Region Valley. And you can see all of the agriculture, that lighter green and some woodlands there. And then to the west are the, the Shangam, is the Shangam Ridge over here. In the valleys, you have a lot of agriculture with uh, muck farms, which these were former large Atlantic white cedar swamps that were converted to muck farms where they grow onions and different crops. And then the ridge is a uh, capped by this white conglomerate, really hard rock, very erosion resistant. So again, people like to climb up there, do rock climbing and botanists like these like to look at some interesting plants too, like <clears throat> this um, broom crowberry here, Carima conradii, which you can only see in New York in Minnewaska State Park, up on the ridge. And also up on the ridge are the dwarf pine ridges. And if you go to Sam's Point down there, you can see these dwarf pitch pines. 
uh, which is a very interesting area, also fire maintained with an understory of wildflowers, um, especially these beautiful pink lady slippers in the spring. All right, we've got a lot of uh, uh, ecoregions sort of packed into the lower part of New York, southeastern New York here. And the next one over is this green one here, 62, the North Central Appalachians. And like the Piedmont, this is sort of split into two areas. This is the eastern, there's one way out in western New York. This is the eastern part of it called the Mongop Hills. And this is an, this is, um, an kind of a, an amazing place which not many people go to. It has inland white cedar swamps. And you can see that here's a middle town over here. Here's the Shangum Ridge. And then to the west, you get this big green area with lots of lakes and uh, forests and little villages, not any big cities. Uh, Monticello's up at the northern end, Port Jervis down here at the southern end. <clears throat> but this is very, this is a high elevation plateau, um, lots of uh, conifers and deciduous forests and very Adirondacky. So uh, it's almost like a, like a, the low hills of the Adirondacks with lots of lakes. Uh, people have a lot of uh, vacation places down there. On the western edge is the Delaware River. You can see the, the low the hills of the Mongop Hills there in the Delaware. And then an example of a more northern natural community, a dwarf shrub bog in the central part of this ecoregion with those conifers in the back looks, again, looks more like a dwarf shrub bog in the Adirondacks. Now, from there, we'll go to a larger ecoregion, the Northeast Highlands, 58. So this encompasses uh, the Catskills. This is, these are the mountains of the state, the mountains and the high hills, you could say, that the Catskills here, the Hudson Highlands, which go across north of New York City, and then the Taconic Ridge, which goes up along New England there with the Taconic uh, foothills. And there's a few other New England uh, ecoregions that get into New York just a little bit, the Marble Valleys and the Berkshire transition. And then the Rensselaer Plateau, which uh, over in Rensselaer County. And I'll talk about these now. And then uh, there's two other ones which we'll get to um, of the Adirondack, that's in Tug Hill, the largest part of that ecoregion. So here's our van coming out of the Catskills, and you can see the higher Catskills. This large ecoregion to the west is sort of the same geology as the Catskills. The Catskills are higher, and they have more of a boreal element, sort of uh, similar to the Adirondacks. <clears throat> so they're part of the highlands. And then down below here, you can see the Hudson Highlands, this green area, and then transitioning over to the Taconics up along um, the edge with New England and the Rensselaer Plateau right here, Rensselaer County. And then of course the Adirondacks and Tug Hill way up in the north. So those are the major highland areas of New York. A look at the Catskill high peaks, mostly deciduous forests, but as you get towards the top, you do get coniferous forests like with more spruce, very boreal up towards the top. And these are mostly sedimentary rocks, which can be easily eroded. And one of the dominant forests there is beech maple music forest. So a music forest that consists mainly of beech uh, with sugar maple and some red maple. But now uh, there's a probably these will change in the near future because of beech leaf disease that is killing a lot of beaches, uh, especially in Southern New York, and that's transitioning rapidly to the rest of the state. So I'm not sure what's gonna happen to, to, this, to these beach communities. But very rich, very 
a rich understory <clears throat> would you know have overabundant deer. All right, so the northeastern coastal zone is between these highlands and oops, sorry, uh, you have uh, the Hudson Valley in the northeast coastal zone. So we went from down here, the New England part of it, up to north of the highlands uh, through the um, the Highland Gap here, the Hudson River, it's almost like a fjord, and then up the Hudson River all the way to just north of Glens Falls. That's considered the Hudson Valley. And this is an area of lower elevation because it was once part of Lake Albany, the Glacial Lake Albany, and that Glacial Lake um, put down a lot of sediments along, along this area, <clears throat> and also some sands which made the Albany pine bush. But you can see us going up 87 here, the throughway is surrounded by highlands, the Taconics and the Catskills. And then when you get towards the, the top of the Hudson Valley are the Adirondacks and the Mohawk Valley to the west. So the Hudson River is, uh, you know, it's only 30 feet elevation when we get to Albany. So it's a very flat valley and tidal all the way up to Albany. But on the hillsides around the, around the valley, you'll see some Appalachian oak hickory forest, which is a more southern kind of deciduous forest. And it, but it does come up the Hudson River Valley because it is, uh, the temperature is moderated by the elevation with some nice understory of May apple. And then, as I said, the, the Hudson River is tidal all the way up to the Troy Dam. So you have what are called these tidal marshes. So these are fresh, on the coast you have saltwater tidal marshes, and here you have freshwater tidal marshes. So you have these uh, mud flats when the, when the tide goes out, and then when the tide comes in, you have these beautiful uh, marshes on the upper edge next to the, to the deciduous, usually uh, swamps, and uh, with things like uh, Biden's cernua, which is the nodding beggar ticks. Um, out here, uh, you see some nufar. This is a nufar advena that that's uh, that lives in the Hudson River in these tidal areas. When the tide goes out, they stand up on the leaves, and then when the tide comes in, the leaves float on top. And then uh, the sands of uh, Glacial Lake Albany were blown up into these dunes for the pine bush where you get these pitch pine scrub oak barrens, pitch pine oak barrens, and uh, dominated by pitch pines, just an amazing inland pine barrens, which uh, has the carnar blue, rare carnar blue butterfly on the blue lupin. So, Got out there in May, it's just an amazing sight with the lupins and, and the pitch pines. So then going north of the Hudson Valley, we'll get back into the highland areas of the Adirondacks and the, and the Tug Hill Plateau. So we have a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, level four ecoregions within the Adirondacks. Uh, we have the high, we have the alpine areas and the high peaks up here in the northeastern part, and then we have uh, the central Adirondacks around them. Then we have the foothill, the eastern foothills on the east, the western foothills on the on the northwest, and going down towards the Mohawk Valley. So lower elevation as you get towards the periphery, and then what they call the acid sensitive Adirondacks, which are the Western again, lower, um, lower elevation, and um, and a little different geology. So here's our van going up towards the middle of the Adirondacks, and you can see just the beautiful green of um, the the forests up there, conifer and deciduous forests, and the many lakes that comprise the Adirondacks. Very large, some small. Um, Lake George is in the 
the, uh, the, the eastern foothills of the Adirondacks. And so you have the high peaks with um, different forests as you go up the peak. So down towards the bottom, you will have more deciduous forests. As you go up, you get more conifer forests as uh, spruce. Um, you'll get more spruce as you go up, spruce fir, and then almost um, complete um, uh, balsam fir as you get towards the top in an area called Krumholtz. Right here, you can see some Krumholtz, these dwarf um, sometimes black spruce and, and balsam fir, and then the open alpine areas, <clears throat> which are these mosses and grasses and wildflowers. One of them is diapensia. You see they're blooming early in the spring, diapensia laponica. Nowhere else in the state are you going to see these kinds of natural communities or ecological communities. And then in the back, you can see those high peaks. And as you go Towards the west and the east, you'll get into the into the foothills. So a lot of the Adirondacks is composed of these lower foothills, these lower mountains and hills, with again a lot of lakes, a lot of wetlands, and you can see in the lower elevations here more deciduous forest, which is an amazing sight in the fall. And one of the the uh, spruce forest, spruce northern hardwood forest, that is very common in the Adirondacks. You've probably, if you hiked anywhere in the Adirondacks, you've probably hiked through spruce northern hardwood forest, mainly red spruce and northern hardwoods like uh, sugar maple and red maple, with uh, some nice understories of ferns and wildflowers, um, like the Soxalis montana. The uh, um, name ex escapes me right now, common name. The uh, mountain sorrel. And of course, there's a lot of human use, even though it's a big green space in, in the state, there's a lot of human use in the Adirondacks. Uh, the economy is driven by lodges and homes in the Adirondacks and services that support them. And down on the lower right, yeah, there are some mining operations there too. And then in the upper right, in the Tug Hill, which is over towards uh, Lake Ontario, which is a highland, sort of a plateau, uh, not really, it's flat on the top with resistant sandstone. And that's a very uh, well-used recreation. There's lots of wetlands for fishing and, and also lots of snowmobile and ATV trails but very large tracts of intact forest. All right, and surrounding all these highlands to the north and to the west are the Eastern Great Lakes lowlands. So the Eastern Great Lakes, Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. And uh, the uh, lowlands are number 83. So you can see here, they start the surrounding, go all the way down the, the uh, St. Lawrence River, and then come up here to the Champagne, Champlain lowlands, which go all the way down Lake Champlain to northern Washington County. So these are, this was Lake uh, Glacial Lake Vermont. It was very, um, it's very, uh, well, it's, it's a lot lower compared to the Adirondacks. It's still hilly but uh, lower hills and more moderate temperatures because of the lake. Here's our van going up uh, north of Plattsburgh here. And uh, uh, I-87 goes through the, the Northway goes through the Champlain lowlands up in that area. And there are, because it's, uh, there's lots of agriculture there and things like orchards because of the moderating effect of the lake. The lake also provides a lot of water for surrounding communities and is a big recreational area. Here you can see sort of a mosaic of, of uh, agriculture, hay fields, and woodlands. And some good and some nice wetlands there too. Here's a typical wetland, a silver maple ash swamp, very dense 
with uh, some tufted loosestrife there to the left. Again, like the um, uh, like the uh, beach forest, the the ash swamps will be changing because of emerald ash borer. So a lot of these ash will be taken out, and we'll see what these turn into. Up towards north of Plattsburgh, you get these interesting glacial features, where Lake Glacial Lake Iroquois, which was mostly like Ontario, drained across as the glaciers melted back. It drained across into Lake Vermont, and scoured out the landscape producing these sandstone pavement barrens and also to deposited sands there too, which made these pitch pine heath barrens. So west of Plattsburgh, you'll see these Heath barrens, Clintonville barrens, dominated by, by a pitch pine and, and ericaceous heath, blueberries and things on the understory. And then these incredible sandstone pavement barrens, which are main, mainly uh, jack pine. Huge areas of jack pine. That's the only place in the state you'll see these huge areas of jack pine. There's not much understory uh, with, again, some of these open areas have heath, but you can see the sandstone there just <clears throat> worn away at very sh shallow soils. All right, now we'll go south, west and south from there to the Eastern Great Lakes lowlands that go from, see the arrow up in the upper right, that's the extent of the lowlands up there. It goes all the way down to the, Huts, the uh, to the Mohawk Valley, down towards Albany, and then down across south of Lake Ontario, down to Lake Erie and southwestern New York. So it's a very large ecoregion spanning all the way from north of the Adirondacks down to the southern part of Lake Erie. So you have the uh, in the southwestern part, you have Erie Lake, Ontario Lake Plain, which is very flat. And you have higher hills of the Ontario lowlands, um, then up into the St. Lawrence Valley, which sort of transitioned to the Adirondacks. <clears throat> and then down in the southeast, the lowlands, which have a fair amount of hills also down to the Mohawk Valley and the Black River up to Watertown. So here's our little van going along the northern part of the lowlands and the flat lowlands towards the lakes. And you can see that there aren't a lot of large intact forested areas here. It's a lot of agriculture because it's flat, easily farmed, and um, uh, easily built upon also. So you have large cities like Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo, and a lot of wetlands in there and all that. And then goes down towards the, the northern half of the Finger Lakes. The southern half of the Finger Lakes are more are hilly and more have more gorgeous. So they're a different ecoregion. But the northern half, uh, you can see a lot of farms, a lot of, not many woodlands, and fairly flat. You do have some glacial features like um, drumlands in this area, a lot of drumlands. Along the beaches, you have sand beaches with Great Lake dunes. So New York is the only state which borders on the Great Lakes, has dunes on the Great Lakes and on the Atlantic Ocean. <clears throat> so we have sand beaches along Lake Ontario and Lake Erie and dunes, which transition to more wooded dunes farther away from the beach, a lot of cottonwoods and uh, a fair amount of nice wildflowers and rare species like dune willow and dune sand cherry. Here you can see a starry uh, on the lower left here, um, Manthemum stellatum, which is a starry Solomon seal. Also because the lakes are there, uh, the large lakes have a moderating effect on the climate along the lakes. And so you have a large fruit industry Mm, about 15 miles in from the lake, the lakes. So not that far, but it has a good moderating effect. It's very flat and you have apple orchards, cherry orchards, things like that. Also north of, west of Watertown, you have another uh, pavement area like that sandstone pavement we saw near Plattsburgh. This is limestone pavement, where again, a glacial feature with a glacier just wore away the 
soil to the barren uh, limestone rock and produced what these communities called alvars, which are, which are plant communities that live on this um, limestone pavement and has a very unique ecology. And all these white flowers are of the rare Solidago tarmacoides, which is called um, upland white flat-topped goldenrod. And then if we go southeast past um, the eastern part of Tug Hill down the Black River and then down to the Mohawk Valley, <clears throat> you can see this area of low hills and again, a mosaic of agriculture and woodlands and urban areas all sort of tucked in there in the Mohawk Valley with the Erie Canal going through it. Major transportation corridor, the only transportation, flat transportation corridor through the mountains, all the Appalachian Mountains up uh, to the Adirondacks. And then again, uh, the northern part of the the Finger Lakes is flatter. You don't get a lot of those big gorges as you do in the south, in the southern part of the Finger Lakes. And it's a lot of agriculture and woodland mosaic with these low hills that drop down to the lake and some larger um, um, urban areas like Geneva and Auburn. But in some of those preserves and larger woodlands, you have limestone woodlands, which occur associated with limestone. And these are very rich. Uh, Menden Ponds, for example, south of Rochester, you get these limestone woodlands with a really rich understory and uh, a nice growth of things like white trillium in the spring. Okay, Northern Allegheny Plateau is the one of the largest of the ecoregions we have south of that sort of flatter uh, lake plain and <clears throat> you start to get higher hills deeper valleys gorges and more forested areas so in the east we go from um, the uh, delaware never sink highlands and the um, uh, the Catskill transition, so the, the, the foothills of the, of the Catskills, to the Finger Lakes uplands and gorges, this area here, these Finger Lakes gorges, and the glaciated Allegheny Hills down here and the Cattaraugus Hills. But the main part here is this glaciated low Allegheny Plateau. And you can see that there is some topography here <clears throat> and if you drive here, we, here we are on the, on the left side going through Elmira, west of Horseheads. Some larger cities, Binghamton, Elmira, Horseheads, Ithaca in this area, down over to Corning. And again, more forested areas, larger blocks of woodlands compared to farther north where we saw, you know, mostly agriculture. And you have some really nice state forests <clears throat> in this area and really beautiful gorges and waterfalls. Small villages. Here's another aerial view closer in. You can see that difference in the, what's happening mostly in the valleys. You have these, you have agriculture, streams, rivers, some villages and uh, pastures, and then up on the hillsides are mostly woodlands. Sometimes you'll get some agriculture, but it's mostly wooded up on the hillsides, on the mountains and the hills around the valleys. Now, there's been a lot of human use, agriculture, as I said before, but also uh, this is an area where uh, gas wells, wells were drilled, also oil wells, but uh, a lot of gas was extracted from this ecoregion and the one we'll see to the southwest. But uh, the gas industry has pretty much um, run its course. It was very, a lot of gas wells in the 80s and again in the early 2000s, but then uh, this whole thing sort of petered out. 
<clears throat> so we have a lot of old gas well um, uh, pads, which really fragmented a lot of this landscape, Be, uh, you know, putting in roads and these pads in the past. On the east, we have the Catskill transition, which is where a lot of the large reservoirs are for New York City, the Papacting, Cannonsville, uh, Esopus, the Gilboa reservoirs, which provide water to New York City and provide nice cold streams for fishing like the Never Sink and the Beaver Kill, very popular recreation areas. And then in the west, you have very erodible shales which produce, again, these beautiful gorges and one of the biggest gorges in the east, which is Letchworth State Park and the gorge of the Genesee River as it flows north to Rochester. Uh, a common forest on the sides of these hills would be Hemlock Northern Hardwood Forest, dominated by Hemlock. Again, uh, being affected by hemlock woolly adelgid. So uh, a lot of the hemlocks are dying, <clears throat> but we'll see what happens there. And uh, not as rich a, of an understory there, but uh, things like Aracema trifilum, Jack in the Pulpit would become, especially since deer doesn't, deer don't eat Jack in the Pulpit very much. And then wetlands uh, include shallow emergent marshes, deep emergent marshes, sometimes on the hilltops, along the streams and the valleys, you'll get these uh, common wetlands, um, sometimes dominated by turtlehead. Uh, this looks like this one's being dominated by uh, rice cutgrass. Now, the last one we'll talk about today is the uh, um, Oh, I'm sorry, this is the second to last one. The North Central Appalachians, remember I said this was divided between the one in the east, the Mongop Hills, and the one in the west, which is the unglaciated High Allegheny Plateau. So this is the, the very mountainous plateau, which occurs in Allegheny State Park mainly. And it's, it's unglaciated, uh, the only area of New York that's been unglaciated. And you can see here, as we take a little trip from Olean west into uh, Allegheny State Park, how forested it is, and uh, really beautiful old growth forests in this area with a lot of uh, different habitats and a lot of intact flora. We have rich mesophytic forest, which is composed of uh, big basswoods and ash and maples and cherries. And uh, it's just an amazing forest to see because of all the huge trees there. And really nice understory of wildflowers too. Uh, one of the places where you see a lot of the round-leaved orchid, Platanthera orbiculata, and then two kinds of Clintonia. We have our common blue bee clintonia with the yellow flowers. And then one that's rare, and you can only see out there, is clintonia umbellulata, which is the white clintonia. And then our last one is the Erie Low Lime Drift Plain. Oh, what is that? Well, if you got to Cattaraugus County, or uh, Chautauqua County, which is the farthest southwest county in the state, it's comp composed mainly of this Erie Low Lime Drift Plain. Drift which means glacial drift. There's a lot of glacial features here, moraines and uh, kettle hole ponds, a lot of wetlands, because you get a, that huge um, lake effect uh, precipitation there. It's cloudy a lot of the time. And then you have a lot of ponds and lakes and then one large lake, that Chautauqua Lake there. So here we are driving out from Jamestown. There's one big city in this ecoregion uh, and you can take this, uh, you can take uh, Interstate 86 across Chautauqua Lake on a bridge. It sort of divides the lake into two and then uh, out towards the western part of the state in this ecoregion. You have the, the low plains here along the lake and then this hilly area here, which again, a mosaic of, of agriculture and pasture and woodlands. 
not as in, large as intact as the one to the east, but still there's a lot of interesting preserves and, and wooded areas out there in wetlands. <clears throat> it's also this ecoregion and the one to the east, the Allegheny, are the only ones in the Mississippi River drainage. So almost all of New York drains north to the St. Lawrence River or to the Hudson River, to the Atlantic Ocean, or the Susquehanna River, to the Chesapeake Bay in the Atlantic Ocean. Here, these uh, rivers and streams drain south to the Mississippi and the Gulf of Mexico. A common forest here would be beech maple music forest with something like um, maple leaf viburnum as a common understory species, a lot of ferns and a lot of wildflowers too. And a common wetland would be a rich hemlock hardwood peat swamp. So you have hemlock on those uh, slopes down to the gorges, but you also have them in dominating these uh, peat swamps <clears throat> in this part of the state with something like um, Caltha palustris as a, as a nice wildflower in the spring, cowslips, marsh marigold. So we've reached the end of our journey. Here's uh, uh, Hartley Park in uh, Lake Woods, Taqua Lake, just west of Jamestown. And we'll take a rest here and watch people in the lake. This lake actually is at over a thousand feet in elevation. So it's one of the highest uh, navigable lakes in the United States. So we'll turn around here after we rest in the gazebo and we'll, we'll start back towards Albany. And as we started back, it was kind of amazing. Uh, I saw this sign here, Eco Regions of New York, leaving the Erie Low Line Drift Plain and entering the, it's kind of amazing. So not really, but maybe you've seen those signs around for you're entering this watershed and you're leaving this watershed. I think it would be nice to have eco-regional signs like this around the state. People would be curious as to what eco-region they're in and what they're composed of. So before we end, I just wanted to talk about the Flora Atlas. If you go, if you search for New York Flora Atlas, you'll come to this page. And there's, a, there's a, um, a map in the middle. You can click on any county to get a list of plants in your county. You can also uh, go to the advanced search and you can put in nativity, you can put native in there and then your county, and you can get a list of just native plants for your county. Um, you know, sometimes these counties make up the eco regions or just a few counties make up the eco regions so you could find out mainly the native plants that are in that ecoregion. And for example, this one for uh, Long Island, Nassau, Suffolk, Queens, and Kings. If we click that, we would get this kind of list showing the scientific name, the common, the family, the nativity, if there's any photo for it. And uh, uh, you can compare it to other species. And if you clicked on one of those, for example, if you clicked on skunk cabbage, one of my favorite plants, shown here at the bottom, what it looks like now in the winter with its uh, flowers still sticking out of the ice, getting ready to bloom in the spring. Uh, click on skunk cabbage and you'll find the page for that species, which shows a map on the right here, the counties where we have specimens. This is specimen based. You can see it's Schenectady doesn't have a specimen yet. And then down below that are other links that you can click on, especially the iNaturalist link. You can see the, where it is in iNaturalist and you can see pictures of it on Google, um, Google Images. And then on the upper left, it has habitat information, some taxonomic information, uh, its status in the state, and then a list of specimens below it and what herbaria they are in. Just, just really good information. You can also support the Atlas. You can donate to the Atlas there at the top. And that's it. So thank you for 
We have a little time for questions. Yeah, we did have it's one coming. question come in while you were talking. Let's see here. Let me get my email at the bottom right. If you want to email me later. So we had, ooh, sorry, I'm having some difficulties. The toddler's sitting on me now. And it's I see. <laughs> Let's see. In regard to the Eastern Great Lakes lowlands and the absence of human development, would that region be far more forested with a maple, beech, birch, ash, hemlock mix? Uh, oh, with the absence of people? Uh, yeah, it would be. It would be a, a, a deciduous forest like Appalachian oak hickory and, and uh, different deciduous forests and, and wetland um, forests. Sorry, I was dropping your email into the chat in case anybody wanted to copy paste. I think I got it typed in there, right? Um, I have another question. I, I decided to type it in it might be so long. <laughs> That's okay. Go ahead. Oh, okay. All right, great. Um I I teach um environmental science and field ecology at the college level. And I often um, get in discussions with my students about native plants and what's native now may not have been native, say, 300 years ago because of the change in, you know, in the plant plant life that's here. You know, we're, we're going back to the question I put in the chat about what the Great Lakes lowlands would have been a long time ago. Um, so I'm just wondering, do we have any kind of history of what was maybe that we consider native now that wouldn't have been native like 400 years ago? Things that may have moved here, you know? On yeah. Their own? Uh, that doesn't happen very often, but um, so, you know, the New York Flora Association defines native as things that move on their own. Right. Uh, versus, versus human movement. So <clears throat> there are a lot of things that have come here through human activity, but not much has moved in on its own, actually. Right. And that's and that's why I bring this up because when we talk about establishing putting, you know, restoring native plants and people talk about things, you know, especially regarding pollinators, things like echinacea are important. But then I then I think, well, would echinacea have been here 400 years ago? Because it's no. such a so exactly so it's it's not technically native although in a lot of cases it's being considered native in the, in that regard so yeah I mean it is native west of here and you know the yes. different ecoregions mm -hmm. to the west right it, it's not native to any ecoregion in New York I mean not right and so, never so really that's seen a distinct, native echinacea and I, yeah that's a distinction I try to bring up with my students and some questions we talk about with, is being careful about what is really truly native so. Thank you. Right. And that New York Flora Atlas will tell you, and some of them are ranked U, which are, you know, they're not, uh, they're unsure whether right. it's native or not. To, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because was this brought in by humans or did it get here on its own? We're not really sure. Right. I mean, even the movement of some birds that moved into our regions because of the change in, you know, could have brought seeds. We don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we That's expect cool. a lot more things to move up here on their own because of climate change. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember back in college, they said that our forests will probably be more like they are in the southeast as, as time goes by. All right. And it looks like we have another message uh, from Kathy. Is there a relationship between the watersheds and the eco regions? or how close of a relationship? Um, yeah, you know, some of the watersheds are mostly within some ecoregions, but they're not, um, some of the smaller watersheds are, but not the larger river ones. So they flow through different ecoregions. <clears throat> um, and you know, if you take in the whole Hudson River watershed you know that that takes in different ecoregions 
same like the Susquehanna. Also, it's uh, mostly the uh, the Appalachian Plateau, but goes into a few other smaller ones too. So no, they don't really coincide a lot. All right, I see that Addie had unmuted herself. I wasn't sure she had a question. And I guess if you would rather just ask your question versus typing it up, feel free to like use the little reactions emoji to raise your hand or if you're lucky enough to not have a toddler bouncing around and can unmute without distracting everybody, feel free to do that too. Maybe somebody can guess what ecoregion that picture is. That wasn't the Oswego area, was it? <laughs> no, this is taken up near Scroon Lake in the eastern foothills of the Adirondacks. All right. Well, I guess if there's no more questions, make sure you snag Steve's uh, email in case you think of any later. I will also be trying, depending on how agreeable the toddler is to get the recording downloaded and cleaned up a little bit so that you're not listening to you know a whole bunch of just dead air and get that emailed out. I would ask, since it's going out by email, make sure to check your spam and junk folders. And if you're using Gmail, we keep getting sent to the promotions tab. So just make sure that Gmail, you got an extra little space to go and check it for our emails as well. So I guess other than that,